the indian national movement can be divided into three phases that of the early nationalist phase assertive nationalist phase and the gandhian phase or the gandhian era thus we can understand that there were several political developments that finally led to the mass phase of the movement of the nationalist movement but the nationalist movement and the forerunners of the same was called the moderates so it was started under a group of people who were called the moderate uh, you know politicians or the early nationalists whose methods included mostly of constitutional agitation so there were people like dada bhai noreji surendranath banerji gopal krishna gokhel firoz shah mehta pandit modan mohan malviya and justice mahadev govind rana de who led the early nationalist movement which focused on you know showing the british the problems in the governance uh, and how the indians were facing certain problems under the governance of british now these people did not want to uh, you know uh, go into a full blown debacle that is why they stuck to the constitutional agitational methods that they chose so we see that the primary methodology or program that the early nationalist focused on was that of petitions appeals and almost begging to the british for the rights that was their own now that did not pay much effect and the british did not pay much heed to the calls that the moderates gave at that point of time so it almost looked like something that was going unanswered but we do have to remember that the early nationalists or the moderates though accused of being very mild in their moderate programs were the forerunners of the nationalist movement and did in fact frame the nationalist movement in its earliest stages so let's see what were the demands of the moderates the first was to include more indians in the ics and government bodies second to organize the ics examination both in england as well as in india and to raise the maximum age for writing the examination third reduction of land revenue and provisions for protections of cultivators and forest dwellers fourth reduction of military expenditure increased investment in constructive activities removal of restrictions on civil liberties and the press withdrawal of the arms act separation of the executive from the judiciary better working conditions for the indian laborers in other parts of the world such as south africa southeast asia and mauritius thus we can understand that all of these policies and uh, you know ideas that the early nationalists or the moderates had were all the demands that were required at that point of time so the moderates thought that it is better to uh, you know trade lowly with the british because at that point of time it would be in fact uh, jarring for the british to get such an opposition and the early nationalists nationalists in fact had an unbound faith on the british that they would in fact pay heed to the problems of the indians but that was not really the case when you know the early nationalists were making their demands the british did not pay any heed so first of all the reaction of the government at that point of time to the congress was mostly of uh, neglect but after a point of time they realized that the inc was starting to gain more importance in the mass uh, of india and that is when the british realized that it was time to come out with certain policies that stopped the growth of the popularity of the inc so initially the attitude of the british government in india towards the congress was that of neutrality and indifference but soon the government adopted hostile attitudes towards the congress the government officials were ordered to not associate with the congress 
and finally we see that with the british realization that the uh, you know early nationalists were demanding and uh, you know making the masses also mold in the same manner to demand for their rights but of course keeping in the constitutional methodologies that was a wake up call for the british now at this point of time in the congress itself there developed a group which was known as the extremists and the group was of the young personnel of the indian national congress now these group of young people they thought that the moderate reforms and petitions and appeals was not the way how the indian nationalist movement should be led now the early nationalists were also people who could not really bring the mass into the movement that area was not covered by them whereas the extremists or these group of young people they thought that without the mass there could not be a nationalist movement because in fact the movement was for the people of india so at this point of time we see that there is almost a debacle that is happening between these growing two factions and differences between uh, the two factions kept growing where the two factions opposed each others believes some of the eminent extremist uh, leaders of indian national congress were aurobindo ghosh and the very famous known trio of lal bal pal comprising of lala lajpat rai bal gangadhar tilak and bipin chandro pal so these people the extremists did not only what they radical in terms of their methodology and all out uh, against the british but they were also the first ones to state about the goal of swaraj that india focused on so swaraj was the new goal of the extremists with the growing discontentment of the extremists and the radicals uh, due to the political changes that were occurring in india the growing atrocities for mines and the way the british was uh, you know treating india administratively and economically with the growth of high amount of exploitation there came a political incident that absolutely broke the point and caused a major blow not only to the national movement but also in the indian mines and that was the call for partition of bengal the call for partition of bengal which was given by the viceroy at that point of time lord curzon around 1905 was something that shook the nationalist movement that was growing and had created its epicenter in bengal so we see before 1905 the bengal presidency consisted of bengal odisha bihar and parts of chatisgarh and parts of assam thus you can understand that the bengal presidency presidency was in fact one of the largest presidencies with so much of area and it was becoming in fact Uh, difficult administratively and that was the cause that was shown by lord curzon as the reason that uh, you know he gave a call for partition the mind behind the partition of bengal was lord curzon who asked it to be divided into two halves of east bengal and west bengal in 1905 so as we were discussing the reason that was showcased was that of the administrative inefficiency that uh, the british were facing at that point of time so the western half of bengal was to consist of the western districts of greater bengal bihar orissa and calcutta as the capital so here if you look at the map then it becomes clear that west bengal would have these portions and east bengals would have these portions the eastern half of bengal consisted of the eastern districts of greater bengal north bengal so these portions parts of assam 
and had Dhaka as its capital. So if you look very closely, then you will understand that parts of West Bengal and parts of East Bengal were in fact not divided because of the administrative difficulty that the British was facing. It was divided on the basis of religion. So with the growing unity of the masses at that point of time, with the coming of the extremist nationalists, the British understood that without dividing the entire nation up, it was not possible for the British to control the masses and to continue ruling them. And the best way to go about it was to go for a communal divide. So in fact, the British started to sow the seeds of the rule of divide and rule policy from the partition of Bengal. With the call of partition of Bengal, Bengal shook to its core because it had become the place where the nationalist movement was gaining its vigor. Now, after the call for the partition of Bengal was done, we see that there is a strike back from the masses which is called the anti-partition movement. The anti-partition movement saw sloganering and people coming out on the streets to protest against this, um, you know, call of breaking up the Bengalis and also the people saw that this was in fact a divide between the Hindus and the Muslims that the British were trying to create. Every city, town, village rang with the cry of Bande Mataram. As you can see, this is the Calcutta Town Hall which became the focal point of the anti-partition movement. Rabindranath Tagore, who was, uh, you know, a leading figure at that point of time in the Indian national uh, movement, arranged for the festival of Raksha Bandhan, which celebrated the unity and brotherhood where Hindus and Muslims tied on each other's wrists the, uh, you know, thread of Raksha Bandhan that portrayed the brotherhood between the two communities. Tagore also composed the famous patriotic song Amar Shonar Bangla for the occasion and it was sung by crowds of thousands of patriots parading the streets. In fact, Amar Shonar Bangla became one of the most important cries for protesting against the British atrocities and the Bengal partition specifically at that point of time. So can you tell me who composed the song Amar Shonar Bangla? Was it Bonkin Chandra Chatterjee, Robindranath Tagore, Kazi Nazrul Islam or Aurobindo Ghosh? The correct answer will be Rabindranath Tagore. So let's hear a part of the song. <laughs> You will be fascinated to know that Amar Shonar Bangla became one of the famous songs that were used in the nationalist struggle and it was, you know, so uh, famously taken by the people and it became a part of the nationalist movement that Bangladesh after its creation observed Amar Shonar Bangla as its national anthem that was composed by Rabindranath Tagore. So we see that the uh, extremists or the radicals adopted the methodologies and the programs of Swadeshi and boycott. So what is boycott? Boycott essentially was the, uh, you know, boycott of British goods, services as well as offices at that point of time. So no usage of any British products uh, and absolute uh, boycott of anything that came from outside India supported by Britain. So this call for boycott saw, uh, you know, burning of British goods on the streets that became an order of the day to show uh, the protest against the British clamped down on India and this also was brought forward by Swadeshi. Swadeshi in literal terms means of one's own nation. So with Swadeshi, the extremists or the radicals brought in front the program of using indigenous products that would not only make the uh, markets grow its economy, but also support the artisans and the craftsmen who went out of employment during the deindustrialization phase. So here you can see 
a paper mill in bengal putting out advertisements to encourage the indians to buy only indian goods so such posters would be stuck all around india so that you know swadeshi and boycott could be promoted as vigorous programs that were to be taken up against the british so we see that there is a establishment of various indigenous industries and people like jamshed ji tata and v o chidambaram pillai uh, supported indigenous industries and the growth and invested in them so jamshed ji tata started off his iron and steel industry and chidambaram pillai set up his steam navigation company so the swadeshi movement spread from bengal to maharashtra and punjab there was also a growth of nationalist education and uh, you know the ideas of national education per se when there was a growth of national schools that supported such kind of education also establishment of various national colleges and universities we see the establishment of bengal national college of kolkata the national council of education which later came to be known as jadavpur university of kolkata and also there was the establishment of pachiappa national college in chennai now with all the, you know these uh, aspects growing in the uh, indian arena the british clamp down increased and the government came out with strict repressive policies the government unleashed terrible repressive measures which dealt a severe blow to the movement and the minds of indian people now at this point of time when the government clamp down had increased to a point where the extremists understood that without uh, you know a uh, face to face debacle with the british there would not be a swaraj any time soon for india they opposed the moderate methods constantly so we see that the moderates and the extremists the radical come face to face and there is an entire break up of the indian national congress where there is a debacle due to the ideologies of the two factions created out of the indian national congress so as you can see these are the moderates and these are the extremists so uh, in the surat session that indian congress held there was a full on debacle between the moderates and the extremists uh, calling for uh, support of each others ideologies but that did not happen and finally the extremists were expelled from congress so the relations between the moderates and the extremists had gradually declined since both the parties were against each others beliefs and the early nationalists were unwilling to come out completely in opposition of the british and still preferred to hold on to the policy of constitutional agitation and they did not want to move, move out of the constitutional structure whereas the assertive nationalists spoke against the false policies of the moderates and demanded more radical action against the british like that of expanding the idea of swaraj through boycott and swadeshi programs in entire india which the again moderates did not support so finally hostilities reached a breaking point when in surat both the factions split out and that is known as the famous surat split so at the surat session of 1907 of congress the moderates and the extremists spread to two different factions of the indian national congress thus we can understand that both the early nationalists and the radicals created a national uh, you know fervor and framework for the growing nationalist movement in a way that would not only develop the nationalist movement but also take it to new heights finally reaching to the mass phase movement or the gandhian era that would be led by gandhi who would take india finally to her days of independence
Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon. You can also register for free at deltastep.com or download the Delta Step app to get access to all our 5000 plus amazing videos as per your school syllabus. Master each topic with our adaptive practice technology, get million plus questions with step by step solutions and unlimited mock tests. Get all your doubts resolved instantly, learn via games and win amazing prizes like playstations and iPads. So, at Delta Step, learning is not just fun and easy, it is rewarding too. So, register for free now.